give everyone just another minute or so to sign on. <clears throat> Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Miley, and I'm the Events and Communications Manager here at the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce. On behalf of everyone here at the Chamber and our event partners, the Delaware County Transportation Management Association and SEPTA, I would like to welcome you this morning to this virtual educational event, where we will learn more about SEPTA's best bus revolution and give you the opportunity to provide feedback on behalf of your business. If you have any questions, concerns, or comments during this webinar, we ask that you use the chat function in Zoom. Um, and now I would like to introduce our event co-host, Tracy, the Executive Director of the CCTMA, to share a few words before we jump into our program. Tracy? Great. Thanks, Jacqueline. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Delaware County Transportation Management Association is very excited to be able to partner with SEPTA uh, to get the word out on what may be once in a generational uh, overhaul of the SEPTA bus network. Um, SEPTA has a bus revolution committee of which DCTMA is part as are the other transportation management associations in the Ring County. Um, but in Delaware County, aside from Philadelphia, we are the county that is most densely populated and dependent on SEPTA. So we would like to thank our partners at the chamber for allowing us to partner and get this word out to everybody who depends on SEPTA for either their employees or for their customers trying to get to them. Um, what I'd like to do is introduce uh, our bus committee chairperson, uh, Daniel Nemiroff from SEPTA. He's gonna go through what the bus revolution is and how you can provide feedback uh, for your locations or how the buses get to your business. Dan? Uh, thank you, Tracy, and thank you for having me this morning, both of you. Uh, so my name is Dan Nemiroff. I am the project manager for the bus revolution, which is SEPTA's first comprehensive redesign of its entire bus network city and suburbs. Uh, we're about a year or so into the project, so I'm going to give an update on, on the year of work so far. Well, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, what the project is. I'm going to talk about the year of work we just completed, and I'll give an update on where we're going for the rest of this uh, calendar year. So here's the agenda, uh, which, I, which I already talked about, but I'm going to talk about you know, what the project is. I'm going to give a recap of phase one. I'm going to talk about the scenario development phase, which is where we are now, and I'm then going to talk about engagement. Um, and peppered in through here will be um, sort of how you all can contribute and be part of the project going forward. So what is the bus revolution? Um, so first and foremost, it is a redesign of SEPTA's fixed, fixed route bus network. Um, we have a really large uh, sprawling bus network. It covers Philadelphia, Delaware County, as well as Montgomery Bucks and Chester counties, and it even goes a little bit into New Jersey. Um, and it's a large network that a lot of a lot of which is left over from old trolley that were old trolley routes, um, you know, that used to run throughout the region. Um, in, on top of that, it's also an identification and prioritization of capital needs and um, identifying where we want to spend capital money in the future to either improve operations or to speed service up or that type of thing. Um, it's an updated service design guide and development process. Um, our, our service guidelines were updated a few years ago, but we're gonna update them again. Um, and we're going to update our development process so that all of our partners are aware of, you know, how, how decisions are made at SEPTA, um, what people can expect um, when they get SEPTA service, that type of thing. And also, uh, we are looking at this project as a way to introduce new service models and technologies. And, and I'll get a little bit more into that in the future, but this includes looking at models of microtransit, which, which I, I, I believe many of you have probably heard of at this point, and also looking at how we can use real-time information uh, to better, um, better educate our customers as to you know, what services are available when they're coming, et cetera. Why are we doing this project now? Um, well, I mean, it, it was a long road to get here, frankly. Um, sorry. Um, it was a long road to get here. Uh, we started looking at this project in about 2015 um, because we were, we were losing bus ridership. Uh, between 20, 2019 and 2000, 2013 and 2019, our ridership dropped 
but operating costs were going up. They went up about nine or 10%. Um, this is not a good situation to be in as a transit agency, particularly, um, uh, particularly an agency like SEPTA that's really dependent on fares. Not all agencies are as dependent on fares as SEPTA is, but, but when your ridership goes down, um, you have to start looking at you know, ways to, you know, to, to get ridership to go back up so you can avoid having to cut service. Um, another reason that we started to look at this is different transportation options started to come online that really changed people's expectations and preferences and offered people greater flexibility. Um, you know, Uber and Lyft are kind of old hat now, but a few years ago they were new and, and, and really shook up transit in, in every city, not just Philadelphia and, and this area. Um, also, we eliminated our transfer penalty last summer, and I don't know how much people know about this, but we used to charge people a dollar to switch vehicles in the midst of a trip. So if you had to transfer from a bus to a bus or a bus to the subway or the, the L, you had to pay an extra extra dollar on top of that. Um, this is uh, this was this is something that had gone out of favor with most agencies. And, and we followed suit and eliminated the transfer penalty, which really allows us to reconsider how people navigate the region using the buses or using SEPTA in ge generally. And then finally, and this is obviously a little more recent, but COVID has really altered people's commuting and travel habits. Um, peak demand is way down. Uh, you know, people are, and not just in terms of when, you know, what days, but also people, you know, they leave work earlier and do some, do some work at home. They, they, you know, they come in later. They're just, it's really shifted how people move around uh, both, you know, commuting, but also just generally and move around like where they live. So we need to really look at how SEPTA can ad adapt to this new paradigm and be a little more responsive. Bus Revolution is part of SEPTA Ford, which is our, our recently updated strategic plan, which is really comprised of three tent pole projects um, that will help us build towards this vision of the lifestyle network that, that our general manager is really pushing um, and that we all feel really strongly about. So Bus Revolution is part of that, but two other projects that you may or may not have heard of are Reimagining Regional Rail, which is looking at um, short, like short, medium, and long-term investments in our regional rail network to make to be able to run it more frequently and make it your, more usable for people, as well as Project Metro, which was the wayfinding project, but is looking at putting the the Market Frankfurt Line, Broad Street Line, and all of our sort of fixed rail services under one Metro banner, um, updating our signage, updating you know our standards and that kind of thing. So these three projects are 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 all you know, the, are the three sort of guiding lights for, for getting at this lifestyle network. And that means a lifestyle network is, is a network that can be used for all types of trips, for all types of purposes, whether they're work trips or, you know, going to appointments or seeing friends. Um, we want people to think about SEPTA as a, serve, as a suite of services that people can use for whatever needs they may have. So I'm going to talk a little bit about phase one. Uh, we, we did wrap it up. I mean, it, it sort of, you know, coincidentally ended with the end of, of last year. Um, we're still sort of dealing with some leftover pieces of it, but I do, in case you're not familiar with the project, I, wanna, I do wanna highlight sort of what we did and, and what we learned. Um, so the project approach, and I, want, I just wanna say really quickly, a, a bus network redesign uh, or bus revolution, which is, you know, previously was called the comprehensive bus network redesign or CBNR internally, um, has a pretty standard approach and we followed, you know, this was a, these project types were being done in Houston and, and Los Angeles and, and, you know, Boston and Washington, DC, and we're kind of following that lead um, and process. So the first year of work is in existing conditions analysis. It's made, and it's made up of three main pieces, state of the bus system, market analysis, and profiles of our, of our individual bus routes. Uh, 2022 um, is when we start crafting scenarios uh, and we start to putting those scenarios into packages so that we can show people different ways of improving the system. And then we will be evaluating those scenarios through the spring and summer, and then bringing a set of final recommendations out towards the end, towards, you know, probably towards the fall or late, later in 2022. And in 2023, we will begin implementation planning. Uh, that does not mean on January 1st, 2023, we will have a new bus network. Implementation at SEPTA is a long, um, arduous process, but we will begin implementation prep at the beginning of the year in the hopes of, of rolling out the new network um, in the fall of 2023. Um, 
some key publications, and, and all of these are available online for, for perusal. Um, some key publications are the, an executive summary, which synthesizes the market analysis and state of the system, um, as well as our summary of engagement. Um, these are sort of the linchpins of the existing conditions analysis that look at the service on a network level, but also summarize the engagement that we did in the fall. And we did a, we did a series of pop-up events. Uh, we did a really large online survey that was supplemented by a phone survey. Um, and we got a lot of feedback as to um, what we call transit trade-offs, which are you know very typical decisions that we have to think about when we are looking at redesigning our bus network, like would you walk further for faster or more frequent service, et cetera. Um, so in, in terms of the state of the system, which really looked at how our network was designed and how it was functioning, uh, some key takeaways are shown here. I'm not gonna read everything, but, but some of the key takeaways were avoiding complication, complicating routings, avoiding alternative patterns. So make sure, make a route only do one thing rather than two things. Uh, operate routes on arterial streets. So try to avoid getting into narrow local streets where you know there could be slowdowns and that kind of thing. Um, serve well-defined markets, that type of thing. So these are all things that um, the state of the system identified as ways we could improve our overall service design. But um, some of this, uh, and, and we asked some of these questions to people during our surveys, and we found that we need to balance these sort of best practice design principles with what people actually want out of a transit network. So, you know, we found when we surveyed people that people are willing to walk further for a bus that travels faster and is more frequent. However, people were mixed about walking further to a bus that is more direct, but further from their, their final destination. Um, and there was some preference for having more bus routes, even if some of the routes are less frequent. So I think this is, you know, people wanna have choice. They wanna have um, some redundancy built into their system. And then finally, SEPTA riders did think buses should serve a smaller, more compact area, but with more frequent service. So when we go about redesigning the network, there are sort of best practice design principles that we are interested in adhering to, but we always have to balance those with feedback that we've gotten through our surveys. Um, however, one thing, that, one thing that's very clear is that the most important issues for riders are frequency and reliability. And those service design principles all impact our ability to provide frequent service and our ability to provide reliable service. So these are all things that are effectively competing, competing interests and competing issues that we have to balance as we go about developing scenarios and as we go about, you know, towards finally, you know, selecting a final preferred network. Um, and then one last bit of, of analysis that was done, and this was in the market analysis, but it does sort of back up our interest in pursuing this lifestyle network is there is greater demand for more consistent all day service throughout the region and including local service. So, and when I say local service, I mean service that's not so geared towards commuting. We do a really good job of getting people to work locations, whether it's Center City or University City or King of Prussia, where there's lots of jobs. We generally do a good to you know, fair job of those things. What we don't do a very good job of is providing local connectivity. So you know, if people are living and working in one area or they want to do shopping locally, a lot of times the services that, that they use to get to work or, or commute aren't necessarily available for that. Um, and that includes service that's not as frequent during the midday or, or in the evening and service that's much less frequent on the weekend. And those were opportunities we identified for improvement. One final piece of the existing conditions work that I, I wanna highlight quickly are route evaluations on our route dashboard. Um, you know, for no other reason than they, it was a lot of work to get them out there. So we did um, deep dives on each individual bus route. It includes information about ridership and speed and on time performance, um, but it also, uh, identify some service improvement opportunities that are that are just ideas, um, but we're looking for feedback on those specifically. So all of these materials are available for review online. Um, we can send links. Um, I can provide links after the meeting so that people can go and click and and look around at your 
at your um at you know at your discretion um, i would say to start with the executive summary because it does a really good job of synthesizing the key takeaways from both the market analysis of, and the state of the system those are both long reports that are about 100 pages each but the executive summary is, is mostly graphic in nature much easier to read and really does provide you with that high level view that you would need uh, to sort of understand the project and, and provide feedback. Um, and also, you know, feel free to send the link around to your, your, your constituents and your partners. I, I think we are still looking to get as much feedback as possible. So that was that as we wrapped up 2021 and got into the first quarter of 2022, that's what we were focused on. Um, at the same time, we're focused on the next phase of the project, which is scenario development. Um, now, we are, like I said before, we're developing two different scenarios, each of which show a, a different approach towards improving the network. Um, and we're going to uh, use this time we have before we go public to we're, we're creating and refining those options. And then we'll go back out in the spring and we'll be public in the spring from April through June effectively, getting more feedback on those, on those things. Um, both scenarios, are really built around some key goals that we have. Uh, putting the rider first. And, and when we say that, we mean we want them to be able to use our system in an integrated way. We want them to understand the system. Uh, we don't want to, we want, we don't want a system that's confusing. Our bus network is very confusing. Um, we have a lot of routes. We have a lot of routes that have a lot of patterns that are going to different places. Um, our schedules are inconsistent. Um, we want to make our service as easy to understand as possible. Uh, whether the route runs every 10 minutes or every 30 minutes, we want people to who use that route to know where it's going, um, you know, know how often it's coming and, and know that they can rely on that service. And I will say we've done a lot of inreach to our operators. Even our operators think our service is confusing. Um, and I think that's, um, that tells you a lot about the network that we've kind of built. We call it kind of the Frankenstein network. Um, and, and so this is a really big, really important goal. And it's a goal that all of these sort of tentpole projects have. Uh, another one of our major goals is increase, increasing access to opportunity. And that can come in the form of jobs or, or opportunities to, you know, to go to you know, doctors or, or what have you, or school. <clears throat> but we want, to, we want people to be able to get farther faster on our system. Um, and <clears throat> we, want to have, we want that goal to have an equity bent too so that people that are lower income and people that are typically more dependent on transit have more access to opportunities. So it's, it's, not, it's not even increasing, it's also improving access. So we, like I said, we do a, generally do a good job of getting people to major job centers, but we want to um, speed up those trips. We want, we want to improve the, the outcomes of those trips and we want to improve the lives of the people that rely on our service. And then finally, we wanna build trust with reliable service. Um, <clears throat> our schedule, we want people, we want our service to be predictable. I think a lot of times when people say they want their service to be you know, faster or more reliable or, or, more, or, more, or you know, more frequent, I really think the key is predictability. People want to go out some, to a stop. They wanna know roughly when the bus is coming. They wanna know how long it's going to take them to get to a place. And they wanna know that that trip is consistent. Um, so this is a this is a short and long term goal that will require working with partners, but we are this is a major part of this project. Um, like I said, we're building two different scenarios, and I want to give you a little bit of information about what people can expect in these scenarios. Both scenarios have certain characteristics in common. Um, they're both cost neutral, um, based off of spring twenty twenty two numbers. Um, and both do offer a simplified network design that includes less duplication and straighter, more direct routes. Um, both scenarios look to integrate to the maximum extent possible. That means making sure buses can connect with other buses, connect with high speed services, and when appropriate, can connect with regional rail. Um, we want those connections to be frequent and reliable, and we want access to you know, services, education, and employment to be a priority. Um, and then we want to improve service quality. Uh, and again, by that, easier to use and understand, more consistent service letter levels, and a better balance of peak and off-peak service. Then there are differences in the two scenarios. Um, and we're going to have a better names for these when they launch, but we call scenario one more dramatic and scenario two more familiar. Uh, I don't want to read everything here, but scenario one, the more dramatic one, will have an extremely high frequency network. like a, We're calling it like a 10 max 
basically where services run 10 minutes or better seven days a week between nine, um, 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. Um, re really simple service, uh, really streamlined. Um, and also we want to improve service coverage in the suburbs, particularly through on-demand services, microtransit, et cetera. Um, the trade-offs with scenario one, there will be fewer routes overall. Uh, so some longer walks uh, and fewer once you ride, so more connections um, and less, less overall coverage um, through bus fixed through bus service in the suburbs and so more transferring. Uh, but that, like I said, there, there will be overall better, more service coverage in the suburbs because of microtransit, but less, less coverage used due to fixed route transit. Scenario two, which is the more familiar option, uh, we'll, have, we'll still have high frequency service, but the trade-off is gonna be a loss in that frequency on the weekend. So we're not gonna be able to provide the same weekend service in scenario two as we do in scenario one. So there'll be more routes, so more options, which will be mean, you know, probably less walking overall. Um, and then scenario two, the trade-offs, you know, lower overall frequency, particularly on the weekends, uh, and less service coverage overall because the less microtransit. And then ultimately harder to understand because it's going to kind of be between scenario one and the current network, which is, you know, so it's going to almost like a hybrid of the two. Oops, sorry. So I, in case microtransit is new to people as a concept, I do want to highlight what it is a little bit. Um, but first I wanna say that like right sizing the service is a really important component of both of these scenarios. Um, and microtransit we do view as a critical component to that. And when I say right, is right sizing, I mean, what I mean is to say is that fixed route transit, like bus service running on a fixed schedule is not a really strong model for every location. It's just not. Um, and we view microtransit as a way to provide better service coverage to areas where fixed route transit has proven to be unsuccessful. And it's also a way for us to test service in new markets. Um, so this chart kind of shows you how different types of land use, dense, land use types and densities um, equate to different types of transit. So, and you can see microtransit is a good fit for, for different types of service typologies. Um, and if you don't know what microtransit is, um, really quickly, it's technology enabled shared transportation. It's typically done with vans. Um, it allows people to on, it's on demand service. So people can schedule it in advance. There's generally a window. People use an app. Uh, it's point to point service. So people can pick it up from a specific location and it takes them door to door and it's accessible. Um, and some models that we're looking at are first mile, last mile connections like from regional rail or from transit centers, that type of thing. Um, some, some agencies have used it as a replacement for low performing fixed route bus service, as I said, uh, and they've used it as a way to expand into areas that don't have the den density or a supportive street network. Um, like I said, fixed route transit is most effective in very specific contexts. And a lot of what we're doing with this is, is focusing on where it's most successful. Um, it's an alternative service option for ADA paratransit and human services customers. And it's also a way to provide late night or early morning service um, for smaller passenger loads. Um, so that's, I just wanted to give you a highlight of, of microtransit there. So as the stuff becomes available online and as, as it becomes, you know, as we start talking about it to the public next month, um, I wanted to give people an idea of how much information we're sharing. Um, so we're the second column with the draft scenarios. So we are making assumptions regarding service types or we're sharing information regarding service types and alignments, headway and span, uh, hours, miles, and end of line assumptions so where buses end and that kind of thing. As we move forward in the project, we'll be providing more and more detail as we go along. Um, so I think it's important to keep coming back to the site, keep coming, keep getting in touch with the project team um, if you have questions about where the project is and what we're doing. Um, one, you know, just a few more slides about engagement and then, uh, you know, I'll open up the floor to Q&A. Um, like I said, we're going to launch next month. And the goal with, the, with this phase of engagement is to collect feedback and input into the ideas um, that will inform the development of the preferred draft network. Um, so we want to be able to communicate the bus network options and the rationale. So we, we want people to really understand the differences in the two scenarios and give us specific feedback about what they like and don't like both within with the scenarios, but also in comparison with each other. Some of the tactics and strategies we'll be using, um, we're going to be doing pop-up events. 
uh, transportation centers, bus stops, and community events, and and we're going to be we're going to have a project bus that'll go around to locations that are a little bit harder to serve typically, um, and we'll have the project materials available for review. Uh, we're going to have an online survey like we did in phase one, which will be supplemented by in-person surveys and paper surveys, um, you know, at the at some libraries. Uh, we'll be doing lots of virtual, um, lots of virtual uh, engagement. Uh, both generally speaking, but we're also going to do targeted engagement around specific parts of the network. So um, when we go live, uh, if you look at the root profile segment of the of the, the project site, you'll notice that we publish the root profiles in sort of geographic subregions, and we're going to sort of target geographic subregions in a similar way with community conversations. It can be a little challenging uh, because the geographic subregions are quite large, but we are going to really try. To, to get people the information they need um, in, the in the best way possible. And we'll also have um, you know, some printed materials available if, if people are interested in, in those. Um, I think we'd love to have some help with this. Um, if you're interested in, in, in working with us and partnering with us, um, you know, help us you know, meet with elected officials and key stakeholders, whether they're you know, groups like this or, or with um, you know, in, in, you know, you know, chambers and that type of thing. Uh, help us make contact with community groups for, for some presentations and conversations. And if you're interested in having our team at an event or if you have an event that you think makes sense, um, we're happy to talk further with you. We, like I said, we have a project bus. We're getting our schedule set. Uh, it should be public in the next week or so. Um, but we are looking for other events to, to go to and, and to provide materials for. Uh, with that, um, I'm all done. Uh, I hope I wasn't muted that whole time. But um, <laughs> um, I'm all done and I'm happy to answer some questions and, and or, or go back if people are interested in hearing more. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, I think we do have a few questions in the q and It looks like we have two from Marianne and one from Laura. Do you see them in there? Uh, yes. Okay, so I'll answer Marianne's first. Um, so her, her question is, how do I request a bus stop close to my business? Okay, so I think this question is often more complicated than it seems. Um, we get a lot of requests for bus stops where there's currently, currently no bus service. Um, so I would first make sure that there's a bus route, like where you want to put the stop. Um, and if there's not a bus route there, that's a much more complicated conversation. Uh, because change that would require us to re if, if there's no bus on your street or, or going to your site, then we would have to redirect a bus route there, which is, which is, at, which is complicated. And, um, I would, e you can, I'll, uh, provide my email address and you can put the request in and we'll take a look at it. Um, but, but often times requesting a bus stop, isn't really requesting a bus stop. It's requesting a bus route be rerouted to a certain location. Um, so I hope that answers the question, but I, I it's, I'll put the email, I'll send my email address to Tracer, I guess you have it, but, but, you know, you feel free to put the site in. Okay, perfect. Um, the second question, uh, Laura Goodrich Cairns, office vacancies are hitting 20% in most first class cities as work environments that can go hybrid are going hybrid it appears Dan himself is working from home today. That is true. Um, how is SEFTA identifying job centers moving forward, especially as in-person workforce is more focused on manufacturing, material, movement, and service industries? So that's a really good question. Um, so I, I am working from home today, uh, as many people from SEFTA still do. Um, I do go into the office. I am on a hybrid schedule like, like the rest of the SEFTA force. Um, but so I think that there's a couple of things here. I think one is that um, even though office vacancies are... Um, going up or, or they're still pretty high. They were kind of like, it's Center City Philadelphia is an interesting, um, an interesting thing where ridership was going down in Center City already. So we were already looking at locations outside of Center City. Um, I think we are really interested in these other types of, of job locations, manufacturing, material movement service, other types of things, because we do think those are growth industries. And that is a really obvious match with a lot of our customers. The issue is a lot of those locations are really difficult to serve with fixed route transit because they're really far away from, um, well, first of all, they're really from far away from where a lot of the people who, who are better fit for those jobs live. And this has been going on for decades. This is not a new um, thing. Um, I, I would say we are always looking 
for more information regarding these locations. But but in terms of like what makes fixed route transit more effective, it's generally a combination of residents and activities. So the reason that transit ridership is so much higher in the city, obviously there are demographic factors that back that up, but it's there's a density of people and stuff. And wherever there's a density of people and stuff, transit ridership tends to be higher. And this goes for all modes of transit, like regional rail is highest where there's a density of people and stuff like along the Paoli line. So I think that we're always looking at, we're always, we do have um, really good relationships with a lot of employers, but, it, but if there are locations that, that you all see as growth industries, um, you know, we're interested in hearing more. And again, I, I would send those in um, because we're, we haven't made any decisions yet regarding what we're doing. Um, and also if you are looking at, if you do, if you are located in a site that's, you know, that that that's currently not served or, or poorly served, um, I think microtransit might be something that you could use. And I'm happy to talk more about that, you know, offline. Um, okay, Marianne has another question. Um, the closest bus stop for the staff drops them off at a location that is unsafe for the five minute walk to the facility. How do I re request the bus to enter our complex so that the bus stop for the staff is more safe? It's the same, it's the same question. Marianne, I think we would have to, we'd have to know where the site is. You can email the site in. Um, we'd have to take a look at it. We'd have to look at what the route, what route currently stopped, what the route is that's five minutes away. We have, we do, we have, we do what we call a deviation calculation, which basically looks at what the impact to the customers that are on the bus is to the deviation. Um, and then we also had, we'd have to talk to our operations department and our system safety department. They have to okay those types of things. Whenever we have a bus that goes onto private property, we have to have that um, okayed by our system safety and operations department um, because not all private property facilities are built to handle our buses. Um, so we, we, so again, I would just, I would email the site in and we can, we can take a look at it. And then Len, uh, will you send the links to the executive summary and the email address? Yes, of course. Yes, we'll we'll supply those. Um, I'll I, I'll I can we can download the the PDF of the executive summary. Just send it as a document. So Dan, it. I have one question. I I don't mm -hmm. know. I was not able as as a host to put it in the the box. Microtransit. It seems right. that each ring county coordinates their community transit with like a different provider. Is SEPTA right. looking to coordinate microtransit with an outsource like community transit? No, so one of the things that we, if we, when it, uh, adopting a microtransit model, uh, a microtransit service, we would run it through our current um, unions. We, we do not think, well, we don't want to run it outside of our unions. We have a good relationship with our unions. Um, we don't want to get, we think microtransit's really important and it's a really mm -hmm. important component of the future of the authority. Um, and we don't want to get caught up in um, arbitration, frankly. Gotcha. Um, we will run it through. We, if, we, assuming we adopt microtransit as a component of this plan or, or another plan, we will run it through our existing um, districts, through our existing labor unions. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I personally, do, I want to thank you, Dan, for joining us today. Thank you for all of this information. Um, we're going to take all of the links and the links mm -hmm. to the SEPTA website where you can see all of these things and provide them uh, to Jacqueline. So look in your follow-up emails from an email for an email with all of the links to the SEPTA website. Um, so you can go through them and provide your feedback and ask any additional questions to the bus revolution committee um, that you'd need. Hey, uh, thank you so much for having me and, and inviting me to thank talk. You. And I'm happy to, you know, if people have questions, I'll definitely get back to you. It's, all, it's me on the other end of the email address. So it's always me. <laughs> thank right. you. And thank uh, you, Jacqueline, for hosting. And thanks to the chamber and thanks to Trish. No, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to partner with the Delaware County Transportation Management Association and SEPTA. And thank you to everyone for attending today. Just a reminder, this is will, this will be recorded um, and posted onto YouTube. So you will receive the links if you missed anything. And additionally, um, any of the information that we said that will be in that follow-up email. But thank you so much. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, please, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and I hope everyone has a beautiful day. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.